and we ended up in Mark Wahlberg's house for Hanukkah and and you know just a, little, a connection was made so as we were trying to get champagne I emailed Mark Wahlberg seeing if he could hook us up with champagne he called me back he said he emailed me I got the email to Sean he called me back he said I told Sean if you do me this one favor I owe you five I, I know this isn't your cup of tea, so I'm that very, is correct. <laughs> I'm All right, very aware of that. Let's make it so painless. <laughs> painless, excuse me, sorry, sorry. Here yes, we sir. go. We're rolling in five, okay. four, three. Thank you very much, Rabbi Biarski, for making time to do this. I'm very grateful. Anything for you, Rabbi Yitzi. Wow, that's, I'm going to hold you to that. Um, you really did. <laughs> <laughs> I did. Let's let's hear about your um, your childhood or your road to w the work, the kind of work that you do. I'd love to get some idea of like maybe what inspired you or what your childhood was like to understand that. Of course, I just want to begin by saying, for the record and for all your listeners, that I'm doing this because Yitzi has been putting on tefillin and has promised to put on tefillin for another hundred days if I do this, and I'm sure all your listeners are going to follow if they don't already. You're going to try to add in Torah and mitzvahs, and that's really the purpose of this, God willing. 100%. I'm also a big fan of Rabbi Yitzi, so. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we'll send this to Rabbi Yitzi, who introduced us. Uh, maybe he'll, yes. he'll, yes. he'll, he'll enjoy. Yitzi Harwitz, yeah. who we both love very much. I have a complete refu shlema. Yitzhi Yitzchak ben bracha. Amen, yeah. So, growing up in Montreal, as a yeshiva student, was asked to go visit um, prisons, upstate New York, right across the border. Uh, it's part of the Rebbe Shlichus, the Babich Rebbe Shlichus, to lift up and inspire and uh, bring Yiddishkeit and a sense of hope and love to those who are behind the wire. And after experiencing visiting people and the impact it had on them and the joy, just from them getting a visit, from bringing them some food, from them being treated like a human being, um, dancing with them, celebrating the Chagim together with them. Uh, you know, you see the, uh, the Rebbe's love for, you know, God's children and uh, felt a very strong connection to this work. And that um, really um, was a critical transformative moment for me in terms of feeling this is the shluchas that Hashem wants me to do. Mm -hmm. But why were you asked to do that? Like, I was asked to do certain things as a kid, but they're tailored to me. How did you get chosen? I don't know, who asked you? Like it, was, it was actually the Babich Youth, Mo uh, uh, Babich Youth Organization in New York. Uh, and I was many students, many students went. It was a, you know, it was, it was a common MIFTA campaign to go visit and went with many friends and colleagues regularly through for the holidays when you were in high school mm -hmm. that age mm -hmm. like was there a particular moment that you realized like okay i'm really connected to this you mentioned some broader themes i remember one i mean there were some moments that really struck me I remember one guy was there just sentenced for 10 years and uh you know he would he said he often got threats because he was wearing his yarmulke in prison but he said there's no way i'm taking it off it's just like it was a really special moment to see such courage and jewish pride I remember seeing someone who was, you know, extremely comfortable on the outside, and now suddenly he was, you know, wife couldn't even afford to buy food, and you saw a sense of despair, and they were so deeply moved that they were not forgotten, and the chizuk that they got, uh, and the desperation and the loneliness they were feeling, and then the transformative impact of them knowing they're not alone or forgotten was really, uh, you know, struck me on a very deep level. So then you develop that into a professional career? You're so, you know, for several years I was volunteering for the Aleph Institute, which was started by the Lubavitcher Rebbe in 1981. Aleph's motto was no one alone, no one forgotten. It was founded in the chambers of Judge Jack Weinstein uh, by Rabbi Shalom Dover Lipsker, a shliach of the Rebbe in Bell Harbor. The Rebbe gave him the mandate to um, build out the Aleph Institute, which he did with tremendous dedication and devotion. Uh, he was, uh, 
you know, one of the stories that Rabbi Lipsker tells is that um, there was tremendous opposition to the work he was doing. It was such a far-fetched concept to help people in prison. Now it's more popular. But when the Rebbe spoke about it in, in the 70s and when Aleph was uh, being built up in the early 80s, it, w- it was such a foreign concept. Um, Rebbe Lipsker tells the story how a group of prisoner, a group of people, a group of incarcerated persons were in prison and they were dancing and learning together. And the warden was so upset that he put them through diesel therapy, which is a, a known practice in the earlier years where someone would get transferred from one prison to another through 10 other prisons. And basically, he took this group of the Jewish community and dispersed them, this is in the 80s, to many different prisons. Couldn't fathom that they were... And in effect, what he did was... He got the word out about Allah very quickly because each <laughs> one went to a different prison and told they met other people there and told them there's a new organization and they started writing to Aleph and this warden helped Aleph uh, become a national organization. Um, and But Rabbi Lipsker also tells a very interesting story about how he once took a group of people on a furlough and they came to an event with other people, philanthropists, and they mingled. And then as Rabbi Lipsker was talking to them, he said, you know, people in prison are normal human beings like you and me. In fact, many of them are sitting in this room right now and people were stunned because they realized they're talking to a regular person, and the person actually a prisoner right now is, uh, you know, is, is in custody, mm. they're just out there on a furlough. But it helped people understand that they're human beings with emotions, with feelings, with wants, with the sense, the desire to belong and to be treated with dignity and respect. And uh, so it was a very challenging journey. And, you know, with Hashem's help, Rabbi Lipsker really built out Aleph to become a premier national organization um, in, in a very big way. So you were volunteering, and then you became so passionate about it that you decided to go professional, and eventually... Yeah, so after, you know, after volunteering for a few years, I formally joined Aleph, uh, first in helping develop the Family Services Division, which is a really important part. You have wives and children that are going through an insane amount of pain, suffering, stigma. Unfortunately, there have been cases where children have committed suicide or have turned to drugs. And you know, So one of Olive's key uh, components is a really robust division that helps the wives, the children, um, helping them visit their loved ones, bar and bat mitzvahs for them, gift programs, therapy, support groups, etc. And uh, it's now run by Rabbi Shua Brook, who does an incredible job with his team. And uh, then moved on to work in, you know, to help, with God's help, expand the advocacy department, which is advocating for people in prison, uh, religious rights, um, family unity, advocacy components, such as making sure they're in a prison where they can get visits. It's in range to get visits from their loved ones, uh, advocating on policy levels for more phone minutes, more furloughs, more visitation, etc., medical issues, and we, you know, Olive helps people from all walks of life. Uh, Olive's work is all pro bono, and uh, we get some 10,000 requests a year, and we try to answer every single one of them and try to address them, you know, based on merit and uh, urgency with God's help. Wow. Was there something in particular from your volunteer efforts that made you think, okay, I need to, I'm so passionate about this, I need to make this my professional career and keep building and building? Yeah, I did. Definitely felt, you know, everyone has, Hashem puts every single one of us on this world for a purpose and for a reason. And God gives us the opportunity to find that purpose and reason. And uh, definitely after visiting and experiencing what people go through and how critical it is to be there for them, I definitely felt that this is what my shlichas in life is, is why God put my soul in this world to help make a difference in this space and Mm -hmm. to try to do my best. Something you told me once has always stuck with me that people would rather have their arm cut off than go to prison, you know, even for a year or whatever, just because of how harrowing it is. And so the work that you do, it's so important to help people, but there's also the element of people did something wrong. Like how do you reconcile the fact that you're helping people that, for the most part, society says, okay, you did something wrong, you need a time out. Yeah. What I think I was sharing, just for context about that comment, is I'm not, I'm not sure if everyone going to prison for a year would want to have their arm cut off. Instead. Right, maybe a year wasn't but the right But I, I think definitely sentiment. people, you, definitely if you 
look at a young father or a young mother. And unfortunately, we interact with many young parents who have just received a draconian sentence, 10, 20 years, where they're not going to see their kids go to the graduation. They may not be at their weddings. The unbearable pain of not being there for their immediate family, sometimes through tremendous hardship. There could be sickness in the family, and they're watching helplessly. I'm sure many of them would would uh, give up, <laughs> you know, would, would, would take an alternative that sounds drastic, but to be there, you know, with their family. Um, you know, I once heard a great line that we have to distinguish between the people we're afraid of and the people we're upset at. There are people we're afraid of who are clearly a danger to society. And while Aleph helps everyone in prison with access to religious rights and medical and so on and so forth, Aleph doesn't advocate for people who are a danger to society to be put back because that's that's a different, you know, it's a different category and, you know, it's not our, it's not something we do. But there are a tremendous amount of people who are in prison that represent no threat to society. Um, to demonstrate this point, under the CARES Act, um, an, uh, you know, an advocacy piece that we worked very much on, uh, on, on helping, you know, advocate for people to get access. It was actually... Uh, what is the so CARES Act? Just so uh, Yeah, so an organization called SEDEC, which is run by Ray Moshe Margaret, and that does a lot of advocacy on the Hill and criminal justice issues, now working on infertility. In fact, they were very effective in advocating that when the COVID uh, legislation was being passed, there should be a component there that allowed for people who are in prison to get access to home confinement because of the dangers and the acute dangers of COVID in prison. Um, you know, less hygiene, people crammed together, people less access to medical care. So there was a big concern about that. And the Bureau of Prisons released about 11,000 people on, on, on home confinement. Of those 11,000 people, only 17 people committed new offenses, only one of which was a violent offense. So here was a forced test pilot program that demonstrated that 11,000 people are out for a significant amount of time already, and, and, and a tiny fraction of them committed you know, an offense, only one of them, a violent offense. So clearly there are a lot of people in prison that do not need to be in prison. It's not to avoid uh, consequences, but there are alternatives to incarceration, sometimes much more effective. The 3553 factors, which are the factors a judge takes into account for sentencing, including deterrence, rehabilitation, and so on and so forth, there are so many other ways how a person, all these five elements can be achieved through an alternative, and that's something that Olive is very focused on. We actually have, Olive launched recently a new initiative called the Center for Justice and Human Dignity, which is led by a great leader, Chris Poulos, um, which focuses on promoting alternatives to incarceration, community service, halfway house, restorative justice, where, where just to give an example, there was a, you know, there was a, in, in, you know, a, a, a prominent federal judge who does a lot of work on restorative justice was telling us about a case where a guy put a swastika on a synagogue. And one way to just throw him in prison, but you haven't changed the person. The hatred only builds. <laughs> but he had this guy meet Holocaust survivors, learn about the Holocaust, learn about hate. And by the end of the process, he built a menorah for the synagogue, and he was a transformed person. Restorative justice is a modality where the often the victim and the offender meet, understand each other, and helps restore what was damaged, and helps restore a better sense of self within the person who committed the offense. So either you could throw a person, lock them away, throw them in prison, you know, and uh, they get locked away for a significant amount of time, but there isn't an, an inner transformation. But when you work with the person, help them transform in a, you know, in a framework the person's not a danger to society, um, the, the, the results are so much more impactful. And that's, you know, the Rebbe's vision about a better and smarter criminal justice system to build people up and transform them instead of lengthy prison sentences. Mm -hmm. Well, before we get into a couple more stories, I would love to hear, like, what would be the one thing you would change about the criminal justice system now? Or it might not be a nuanced enough question, but if you could change one thing, what would that be in order to make it a, a more just system? Prison shouldn't be the default. It seems like now prison is the default for almost any offense. There are more and more judges and prosecutors that are receptive to alternatives, but it seems like 
that's those are the exceptions, not the rules. It should be the opposite. Only when a person needs to be put prison is such a drastic step. You know, even you know, it's interesting in Tyra, there's a concept of Ari Miklat where a person kills someone by accident, they have to go to a city of refugee. Even then there's so many considerations given to them to make sure they can live a normal life. Their teacher needs to go with them to the city of refugee to, so they can have a proper education and they can live a normal life. I think we need a paradigm shift uh, in terms of, I personally believe that, I know it's a drastic thought, but I believe a lot of decision makers should actually spend uh, some time in prison to understand. Even then they won't fully understand because they always have the ability to walk out anytime they want. But just to really experience what it's like and the damage it causes on the person's psyche, on the family unit, on society as a whole, uh, it would be transformative. The former, um, so that's one key area. The other key area is more humane conditions of confinement. Um, there are so many troubling aspects to our prison system, solitary confinement being one of them. I was speaking to uh, an amazing leader, Rick Ramish, who was the Secretary of Corrections, I believe of Ohio, I forget which state. He actually spent the night in prison himself when he was a secretary, when he ran the whole correctional system. And then he himself um, um, abolished basically the whole solitary confinement system in that in his prison system. So I was meeting with him recently at a, an American Correctional Association conference in Florida. And he was telling me that they wanted to do an experiment on rats to see the impact of solitary and it was nixed because they felt it was too cruel <laughs> to keep rats in a limited space for a lengthy period of time. And yet human beings are kept for days, weeks, months, often without any public safety rationale, just kept in solitary confinement. So our conditions and how we warehouse human beings needs a total transformation. And uh, like we're living in historic times. Um, the, you know, the Attorney General nominated an amazing leader, Colette Peters, Director of Bureau of Prisons, who's on a mission. She's a woman on a mission. She's transforming the prison system into a more humane system. She did that in Oregon, where she was the director. And uh, God bless her. God put her in the right spot. And we're really excited. There's a whole new sense of hope in the whole system because of her leadership, her vision, and her compassion. Mm -hmm. With God's help, amazing things are around the corner. That's really beautiful. Do you have a meaningful win that you were able to either propose alternative sentencing or some sort of way of lessening a sentence for someone or making someone's life better who would otherwise be in a uh, world of hurt? Thank God there are literally hundreds, <laughs> or if not thousands, of such stories of the past, recent future, mm -hmm. the past, uh, you know, uh, over the past few years. Um, one that comes to mind is, uh, you know, a young, a young gentleman in a prison in Georgia. Um, and, and here's sort of, you know, Olive's mission of digging deeper and getting to know the person, because often you just look at first glance and you look at the story, and and that's really what it's about. Is you know part of Olive's sentencing team, which is led by Rabbi Yossi Brisky, a, a really dedicated and talented leader who travels the country, um, advocating in courts for judges to give uh, alternatives. Uh, he has a team, um, including a mitigation specialist, community service coordinator, a lawyer that puts together, you know, uh, submissions. So he flew down to Georgia to meet with the prosecutor. In prison was a young gentleman caught with a significant amount of marijuana in his car, facing a 10-year sentence. And Rabbi Brisky went on to tell the prosecutor about this young man's life. Grew up without a father. Mother was, I believe, a prostitute. Very unstable house. She got remarried to a gentleman who became a very supportive stepfather for this young man who was in prison became very close, and then one day he woke up and found his father dead with an aneurysm, which led him to a life of drugs and led him to be in that car filled with marijuana in Georgia, facing a 10-year sentence. And Ari Brisky represented Aleph's desire to help this man, young man. And this guy gave up. He was in prison. He didn't expect any hope. He didn't expect anything. He just was resigned to his fate. And, and you know, God visits and support from Aleph. And... A commitment was made to the prosecutor that Olaf would take him under our wings and help him. As a result, he was reduced. He was sentence was reduced by many years. He served, I believe, two or three years, and went to Israel. He's thriving. He he's thriving. He's doing well. A new lease on life. And you know, in another case in Boston, we worked with a public defender, a young guy who was facing a 51 to 71 month sentence 
for theft connected to gambling sounds like you know obviously a serious offense but you get to know his story he has four young children at home their mother his wife is a drug addict not a functional mother he's the only parent he himself lost his father in prison his father died in prison also connected to a, a fraud connected to gambling and he really needed help and Olive put him through a gambling anonymous program Olive had him work in a laundromat he said even though his hands were dirty they never felt so clean because <laughs> he was working to pay back the money and the judge recognized that what Olive was sharing work with the federal defender was authentic and that this man is a transformed person and there would be no point in just following the sentencing guidelines which unfortunately many judges just do um, and gave him time served and he's thriving he's with his kids thank God no recidivism and it's a new lease on life and look at the other trajectory God forbid his kids would have no parent big chance there's a 5 to 600 percent greater chance that kids who have a parent in prison will themselves land up in prison or turn to crime so it becomes a vicious cycle and with God's help Olive is working to implement the Rebbe's vision of lifting these people up and giving them a new lease on life and effectuating a very positive change which has such a ripple effect the Rebbe would often say one candle chases away a whole room of darkness just have to light one candle and one life one is Shama one soul at a time what are the sentencing guidelines you mentioned that in that story what, what are they can you describe them a little bit yeah sure they're um, you know Congress enacted a system the, the original idea was to create a certain sense of uniformity between a criminal justice system so if a person committed an offense in Boston and in Oklahoma they'd get um, a similar so it, but it I think most people recognize that it's had a very negative impact uh, on many levels. Because it's, it's like it's putting a mathematical equation to it. It's a rubric. Yeah. And it's putting a, you know, really just a number system which often is so detached from reality and so detached. Um, so it used to be binding. Now, under Booker, U.S. Supreme Court ruled that it's advisory. Many judges recognize the absurdity that sentencing guidelines often achieve uh, and therefore give variances. But basically it's a system where, based on the person's prior conduct, loss amount, uh, many other factors, um, leadership in a, in a scheme, how many people were involved, how many victims, a mathematical equation that generates uh, a sentencing range. And then now judges are still mandated to make the sentencing guideline and use that and then use that as a starting point but then they can vary they can say oh there's a really compelling mitigating circumstance we're going to give a downward variance etc um, as i mentioned before living in historic times the chair of the sentencing commission judge carlton reeves from mississippi is a is a is a, a godsend a, a real leader and is really there's a quorum thank god for the first time in many years so the sentencing commission is active and they're effectuating serious change Aleph and the Center of Justice Human Dignity were actually invited to come speak. And Alan Weingrad, who is a former uh, U.S. attorney and a senior partner at Covington, who does a tremendous amount of pro bono work, testified about expanding compassionate release. And thank God the Sentencing Commission is doing real amazing work. Wow. Oh. I know that you were involved a bit in um, the pardon for or commutation for Rubashkin. That's, that's been covered. I'm curious if you... Have any other pardons or commutations that you've submitted that were successful that you'd care to talk about? Because I especially want to hear what that process is like. Sure. Um, Shalom Rashkin was obviously a really uh, compelling case. And talk about shluchim, you know, messengers that God sends. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Gary Apfel, who is a very dear friend, a brother, um, came to my house one night. He was insisted on paying a pledge. I had asked him to help pay for someone's rent who needed help, and he came, and he said his father taught him before you travel, take care of your pledges, and he was leaving to Philadelphia on a business trip. He was with uh, a large firm. He led the 500 attorney team that restructured General Motors, represented Starbucks, and when we ended up talking about Shalom Rabashkin that night, he was so adamant to help. He said, I've been hurting for him. Mm -hmm. I really want to help. Um, I told him his partner, Louis Free, the former director of the FBI, who's subsequently became a dear friend and really a, a real blessing 
He does a lot of pro bono work with our institute, with Aleph, and just always there to help people. We were trying to get his support, in addition to the six former attorney generals that Aleph secured the support. And Gary, um, in his typical attorney verbiage, he wants to do his due diligence and uh, meet the daughter. He met the daughter, and he just said, that's it. He's mm-hmm. all in. He, got, he did a lot more. He got Louis Free, which is a huge blessing. He got Louis Free engaged, and Louis has been very helpful. But he also dedicated the next four and a half years pro bono to help lead the effort. Uh, he was the one who got the call from the White House, Baruch Hashem. He really oversaw the whole strategy and was Hashem's shliach to help Shal Martha get out. And now he's been working with Aleph uh, full-time, pro bono, mm-hmm. for the past basically 10 years collectively. Uh, a case that comes to mind, there are a number of cases that come to mind. One is a case of Daniela Gozis Wagner, a young woman from Texas who got a 20-year sentence. And this is where the sentencing guidelines can go absurd. She was working, making about $65,000 a year in a co- company later charged with health care fraud. Because the loss amount in total which, by the way, sentencing guidelines incorporate intended loss amount. So it ended up being significant, over $10 million. Anyone in the conspiracy, which includes her, even though she was living in a tiny apartment, had a sentencing guideline. I mean, not anyone. She got a sentencing guideline of 30 years, and the judge ended up giving her 20 years, saying he was giving her a break by giving her for 30, a young single mother in her early 30s with uh, two kids at home. And uh, devastating. Uh, I was there at the sentencing next to her son when she when he actually asked the judge if he can give his mother one hug. He hadn't held her hand in 18 months, and the request wasn't granted. He was bawling his eyes out. I was sitting next to him. And I, when I came back from that sentencing, I couldn't function for two days. I, I couldn't believe I witnessed what I just witnessed, a single mother in chains. They wouldn't take off the chains right across her son. She couldn't even lift her eyes up. And her daughter, who was becoming best mitzvah, asked if she could move into prison with her mother. That's how much she missed her. And, uh, you know, Gary, who was instrumental in being the point person to work with the White House for clemencies, um, Baruch Hashem Aleph was able to get 130 former federal judges and prosecutors to support this effort. And uh, thank God she was released two and a half years into a 20-year sentence. She's back home. She's working. She's with her kids, her daughter, her son's still in Texas. And she's really alive again, thank God. Another case is actually out here in Los Angeles, a guy, uh, Noah, who, who, you know, again, you get to know their stories. He he um, got a 17-year sen- sentence for marijuana. How did he get a marijuana? He was beaten by someone abused and that, who himself landed up in prison, this man. And to numb his pain, he turned to marijuana and ended up in dis- marijuana distribution. And he got a 17-year sentence for that. was in prison. The mother of his two children died. Um, while he was in prison, the guardian severed the relationship with him and his kids. And um, he never gave up hope. And he always believed that God would give him a miracle. And he's one of the clemencies that Aleph got. Is, it was, he had served six years, six and a half years. But uh, he, n- he never gave up hope. And he was released. And he's now actually remarried, has a child, is a top salesman the company he works with, and is thriving again. So these are some of the many miracles that we're fortunate to to see with God's help. You mentioned getting 130 signatures. That that sort of effort, that collaboration, uh, it's hard to fathom. But that's that's amazing, and those great, stories are great, amazing. Thank God, a great team at Olive, people who care heart and soul, um, and really dedicated. And in many cases, I've worked around the clock finding potential signatories, reaching out to them, following up with them, cold calls, cold emails. But thank God, and a lot of amazing people who lend their name to the effort uh, and really champion the causes. Uh, Larry Thompson, the former Deputy Attorney General, being one of them, and many others who really go out on a limb to really make a difference and save lives. What, what do the packages look like when you're asking for a pardon or clemency or commutation? And maybe you could break down the differences between those three and, like, do you, it's like if you send a demand letter in a civil case, you ask for 100000 and maybe you get 50000 Like, do you ask for the full pardon, expungement, let's get him out, and okay, but we'll take a commutation? Like, how does it work, and what, 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 what's said in those letters exactly? Yeah, that's a great, that's a great question. Um, we definitely don't work on pardons. Pardons are to, we, we have in some cases when there's a compelling reason, 
but generally our focus is to bring out a person at a present, which is a, a con- which is a clemency, which is the same as a commutation, which is cutting the sentence. There isn't a negotiation. Hey, part of it, okay, we'll settle. It doesn't the Justice Department doesn't you know work that way. But we submit, um, you know, presentations. And what a presentation looks like is basically there's a, there's a formal form that the part in the attorney's office has uh, on the federal level, state level have their own systems, and then we usually do an addendum which includes a narrative that really tells the person's story, uh, mitigating factors, were they molested as a child, um, their transformation in prison, supported by documents, sometimes by notes that the chaplain or others have put in the system, you request that, by medical conditions, people who knew them write letters. We often do mitigation videos, which we find to be very powerful, where you take a five-minute video, because when you want to get a decision-maker to really understand the depth, there's only so much written word can do. A live video, we found, can be very effective to bring to life the urgency, the depth, the sincerity, the mitigating factors. And we present them often. You know, we've secured support from former judges and prosecutors who weigh in and on the merits of, of this case once they've reviewed it. That's what it generally looks like, mm. and a lot of praying. I recognize that you have to work with many different administrations and different officials, but I think you had a lot of success in the Donald Trump administration, and he gets a lot of flack because he can um, do certain things that irk certain people, but in terms of the prison space, was he someone that you were able to work with in a way that was uh, beneficial for your cause? The Trump administration did a lot of good work for the criminal justice system. You know, they achieved the First Step Act, which was tremendous. Uh, what is that? What is the First Step Act? The First Step Act is a major legislation, a bipartisan piece of legislation around criminal justice reform. One of the fundamental, there are a few components to it, one of the fundamental components of it is that people can earn more good time by taking rehabilitative programs in prison to incentivize them to participate in programs that help them become better people and get out earlier. And the Rebbe's remarks in 1976 called for exactly that, for allowing people to earn more good time and becoming productive citizens. Uh, the vision is just incredible. Like time and a half if they go to an AA meeting group. and, and They can earn up to 15 days a month. And there's certain categories, there's pattern scores, but but certain people, low-level offenders or not, you know, in camps can earn up to 15 days a month um, by taking par- participating in programs. And Van Jones, a dear friend who... Who you know, a good, f- good friend, good, great person who was, you know, played a very critical role. You know, spoke recently on camera about the Rebbe's vision, uh, for the which resulted in the first step back. Mm. You've also done some work in the international space. The one that I have some intimate knowledge of, and others not really. But before I get to that, you have such a unbelievable optimistic attitude, and yet you work in, in a space where there isn't really, you know. What like what keeps you going? The uh, Baba Chirabba teaches us the the Baba Chirabba personifies being the epitome of optimism, seeing the good in everyone in every situation. I highly recommend a book to your readers. Uh, I sent out many people positivity bias. We actually printed thousands of copies and sent them to written by uh, an incredible writer Rabbi Many Kalmanson. Chabad Shleach in England and there are so many incredible stories where you see the Rebbe's bias towards being positive in situations. One of my favorite stories is where a uh, very uh, rebellious child is brought in by his mother to the Rebbe saying he doesn't listen in class, doesn't listen at home and, and the Rebbe asks him if that's true you know, of course he says you don't listen to your teacher? No. Your mother? No. You go to school? No. You go to shul? No. And the Rebbe with a big smile said, ah, he's saying the truth. And the boy went on later to say how it totally transformed his life. The Rebbe didn't scream at him, didn't scold him. The Rebbe brought out his positive virtue. And that was transformative for his life. And uh, I have a long way to go to be on the very kind level you describe, but that's definitely something that I aspire to. And mm. Well, moving into the international context, I'm curious about the story of um, Jakob Ostreicher, Jacob Ostreicher, sure. who I spoke with this morning. He, 
he told me that he wouldn't be having this phone call with me today if it wasn't for you. That's what he said. I love Yankee, but he's not correct on that. Hashem has many shluchim. He would have, he'd be having his phone call, <laughs> uh, phone call with you, but he'd be out. That's what he meant. Um, and um, maybe you wouldn't have a phone call because I wouldn't be involved, so the synergy <laughs> wouldn't be there. But he would be out because Hashem wants him to be out. Um, Yankee, I love Yankee. Great guy. Um, very, very strong, courageous, and funny guy. Uh, this, you want to know the story behind yeah, it? Yeah, please, that would be... The story is like this. Yankee Ashtrecher, there's a Nightline piece on his story. He was uh, involved in a significant rice venture for a Swiss investor, investing some $20 million of rice, and tremendous corruption took away his company, his money, I believe the equipment, and just charged him with some absurd fraudulent charge. Where... So Bolivia. a Swiss investor, and he was running the investment, and it was in Bolivia? Yes, yeah. okay. it was in Bolivia. And he was in a horrible prison, inmate run. Nightline did a piece on it. People died in there all the time. And, uh, you know, Olive was working to try to save his life. Many groups were. Um, and many, very, you know, a lot of American government officials were working. Um, Jimmy Carter, to his credit, we had a call with him. He spoke to the, I mean, he said he was going to reach out to the Bolivian president, Evo Morales, who he knew. They he used to visit Jimmy Carter and his uh, pl- peanut farm in Atlanta. Um, then one of uh, a, d- a dedicated colleague at Olive, Robert Shmuley Reitman, who is a brilliant researcher. I remember sitting in the office one day on Wilshire, and he says, Champagne could help because Champagne was close with uh, President of Venezuela, Hugo Chavez. Sean Penn, the actor. Sean Penn, the actor. Um, so um, we went on a mission to try to reach him, get him involved. Of course, people told us there's no way he's going to help. Uh, waste of time. Didn't waste of time, but just, anyways. Um, by Divine Providence, a little while earlier, I had met a young man. His name is David Milner, dear dear friend now, uh, on Sukkot, right here on Beverly and Poinsettia. And we benched a little of an Esrik together who was pushing his mother in a wheelchair. And uh, it was a two-minute interaction. I made a bracha and moved on. A year later, a little less than a year later, I was returning some Sefer Torahs, a shul here on Beverly, at Jacob, because we had borrowed them for Rosh Hashanah Kippur to bring to the prisons. Olaf sends young yeshiva boys to stay in RVs or hotels outside prisons. And I was going to Taft at the time with some other friends, and we borrowed some Torahs to bring to Taft and, uh, in Bakersfield. And bring it back. And this guy comes over to me and says, do you remember me? I didn't remember him. He says his mother passed away. He was the one, you know, eventually of an Esther with. And um, he's doing Kaddish. Wasn't religious at the time, but he was coming to say Kaddish. Very amazing son, very dedicated to his mother. He ended up coming to our house for Sukkot. We became close friends. He came to my in-laws' house and became close friends. Thank God he's been coming to our house almost every Shabbos. Became like part of our family. He brought over a friend of his, Aaron Zell, also amazing human being, amazing Yid. Um, who worked for Mark Wahlberg, and we ended up in Mark Wahlberg's house for Hanukkah, and, and you know, just a, little, a connection was made. So as we were trying to get champagne, I emailed Mark Wahlberg, seeing if he could hook us up with champagne. He called me back, he said, he emailed me, I got the email to Sean, he called me back, he said, I told Sean, if you do me this one favor, I owe you five. Sean, God bless him, went down, and uh, from a totally altruistic perspective, went down and started to fight and fight and risked his own life at some time, arranged a Venezuelan security detail in prison for Jacob, got a medical care, and put his own life on the line. He was putting a lot of pressure in Bolivia and got, was the messenger to get Yaakov Ostreicher free. And thank God Yankee landed in L.A. Um, I think it was around Hanukkah time. Sean was there to greet him. It was a beautiful miracle. Sean was there to greet him. He was. It must have been very satisfying. Smoking in LAX. Probably the only person who gets to smoke in the airport. <laughs> he got to smoke in LAX. He has special privileges. Where Was he flying private? Maybe that's why. No, they? no. I don't think so. <laughs> okay, cool. What, there, there's, a, there's some write-up about it, too. You mentioned that there was a piece that was done. There was also another write-up that he staged a soccer game or something in order to help get some sort of uh, leverage or I, I wasn't clear on that part I don't remember that part mm-hmm. it could be I don't, I don't remember that part mm-hmm. well also in the international context you've helped Afghan women and children specifically female judges that were prosecuted by the Taliban that's actually one way that I became familiar with some of your work but maybe you could describe that effort and what was 
what was going on at the time, why you felt compelled to help. Yes, he's being very humble. He got familiar. Yes, he was working day and night and helping us tremendously and networking with law firms and contacts. I was able to prepare. I knew you would compliment me, and I know that I can say that whatever 1% of the work I did, it's just exponentially, right? Stop, like stop. We're all partners. We're all shluchim. <laughs> okay. Um, the, yeah, I mean, this is an area that I think, um, you know, we've seen from the Rebbe a tremendous love for all of humanity. Um, there's a famous story how a, a senator came, and the Rebbe asked him to please help the welfare of Chinese in Chinatown in New York, and he was expecting that the Bavitcher Rebbe would ask him to help the Jewish community. And the Rebbe took an interest in making the lives better of Chinese people living in New York. He was really moved by that. And there was a moment where, you know, we hooked up through Aleph's, you know, focus on the criminal justice system. We ended up connecting with a group called the International Association of Women Judges. Amazing people who run it, uh, Judge Susan Glazebrook and Vanessa Rui and a great team. And um, that morphed into an effort to... Uh, rescue female judges, now prosecutors, both male and female, and others who were at great risk. And many of these judges, young women, some of them pregnant, with young uh, mothers of young children, who were facing persecution. The Taliban terrorists that they put in prison were now chasing, persecuting them. Their names and numbers were given out. They were getting threats. They were living in basements in fear. So Aleph, uh, you know, we got together and worked with partners, and we ended up chartering some planes and we still have an operation there called this new operation called Jewish Humanitarian Response it's a new organization led by uh, Caroline Marks a remarkable leader a former executive at Comcast an Australian lo- lawyer who works around the clock uh, rescuing uh, vulnerable human beings and giving them a new hope on life one of in one of these cases there were five but through Cheryl Sandberg hooked us up with a group that told us about five orphans their mother died their father was executed because he worked for an American organization and they were writing, begging for help. The oldest was 19. He said he would only cry at night. He didn't want his siblings who he was watching to see him afraid. He was on one of the planes that uh, was sponsored. This first plane was, uh, it was just an amazing story. They were put on a plane and it was actually on our second flight, which was sponsored by Gordon Kaplan, a dear friend, and his uh, colleagues who uh, just jumped in and within a day put together the funds for our second plane. And they were on that plane and they became very close with some Aleph staff in Canada. Uh, the oldest one said he wants to move to Canada because he wants to be next to Rabbi Yassi. These are, you know, Muslim children and working together with a Chabad rabbi. It's really a beautiful Kiddush Hashem and some great footage of them. You know, Aleph worked to get them sponsored to Canada and they're thriving, living in Toronto right now and living a, a very beautiful life, thank God. That's amazing. You must also be getting a lot of pushback or must have gotten some pushback on that. And that makes me think of like the Rebbe getting pushed back in like the 70s, but he had the foresight to understand that that would be helpful. Someone that was on the case, also Helen Kennedy, she told me that for her, she knew that there was like a Holocaust that had been ex- there, were, there that there were that there was a Holocaust, and so she saw some some kind of situation that was similar, and she felt compelled to to help. Is that something that motivated you to? No doubt, no doubt. You know, it, it's what what we went through and. You know, by and large, the world was silent on many levels. Uh, silent in the sense of the Taliban taking over suddenly this country that had been... I'm talking about during the Holocaust. Oh, excuse me, excuse right. me. I'm saying, no, I'm saying that notion that, you know, the world was silent as we went through the unspeakable tragedy. It's, it, was, it was hard or impossible mm-hmm. just to watch it happen to innocent people and not do something. It just wasn't an option on the table. Mm. Um, going back to just the, the domestic stuff because you get involved in the stuff that isn't so exciting in the Mark Wahlberg-esque stories or international crises there's things that are very much on the ground that you're in there helping people with um, is, are there any stories that come to mind that illustrate what prison is like for someone once they're actually in there? I mean, is there someone that, some some person that you developed a relationship with that is stuck that you feel like the, the world should know about? It's a great question. Um, Could be too many people because I know you develop connections with folks that are in this situation. Right. Um, 
I, I, it's hard to identify one because there are so many worthy cases that need more attention and, and more help. I think there's a message about the need for people to care, and people, many people do, but for there to be a greater sensitivity and not just writing someone off because they're in prison and they have a mugshot. They're a human being like you and I. They may have made a mistake. They may have been unjustly sentenced. And uh, I think we need to open our arms um, and help these people on a greater level and mm -hmm. be there for them. If there's any other closing thoughts or advice that you may have, I mean, definitely people just shouldn't go to prison. That that that. That's and again, uh, I'm not saying you know there are people who are in danger and clearly need to be, but mm -hmm. just the. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think there are tremendous opportunities for people to help. If anybody wants to learn more or wants to volunteer uh, to visit a lonely person in prison, mm -hmm. I know there was um, someone that was in Maryland, and someone came over to me and said that uh, he used to visit a person, and he was stopped because the person got transferred, and the person of taking his life. And on a positive note, Robert Lipsker says a beautiful story about his wife went to visit a person a woman, and uh, she came down that day, and she said, I want you to know, I was planning on ending my life today. And I asked God for a sign, and you came to visit me, and that was God's sign. So there's so much opportunity, and anyone who's interested in learning more should reach out to Olive Institute. And there are volunteer opportunities to write to someone. There's, you know, Olive's international program, which works in about 30 different countries, uh, providing spiritual support, visitation, treaty transfer advocacy, uh, run by my dear brother Lipa. Um, he was saying how one woman in a Slovakian prison said that the letter, Aleph sends out weekly letters in multiple languages of inspiration, Torah thoughts. She said she reads every single letter 100 times in her prison cell. Mm. Uh, a guy in Cambodia, Danny, who was a former soldier in the Israeli army, who Aleph helped get out, thank God, Gary Apple was very instrumental, um, said that... Uh, uh, in fact, in this case, a uh, very prominent hedge fund manager, Dan Loeb, who played a very important role. He's become a very big uh, blessing in Olive's work and uh, been instrumental in, in the Daniela case that I told you about before and uh, opened doors all over the world besides for his philanthropic help. Danny would say that when he get the letters from Olive, no one alone, no one forgotten, it meant the world to him. It lifted him up. And every one of us can be an ambassador for that message. You can change someone's life. The Baal Shem Tov says that a person's soul can be here in this world for 70, 80 years just to do a favor for another person and to lift someone up. And the fact that you're hearing about... I better not do a favor then. I don't want to go. Yeah. <laughs> no. See, yeah, we need to hear you. See, um, <laughs> the, the, I don't know if it's two short stories of the Rebbe that tie very much into this theme. One is it would take... Um, People would, you know, would take months often to get a meeting, a yechidus with the Rebbe, a soul soul encounter. One person was told, and he wanted to speak to the Rebbe sooner, he uh, was told to stand outside the Rebbe's house, and the Rebbe would not ignore him. He did that. And yeshiva students weren't happy. He had the Rebbe's time, every second accounted for. And they let him know their feelings. And he felt terrible. He wrote a letter to the Rebbe to apologize. And the uh, Rebbe wrote back. And the theme, I don't know the exact words, but the theme was two points. One is that the yeshiva students belong in yeshiva, not monitoring, <laughs> you know, <laughs> not being like the policemen to it. <laughs> and the Rebbe then said, along the lines of this theme, how the neshama comes down here in this world to help another person, the Rebbe said, maybe the whole purpose of my neshama coming down onto this world was to spend those 10 minutes with you. Mm. And think about that, what, you know, what <laughs> the way the Rebbe transformed this world and continues to have such an incredible impact in this world. And maybe my whole purpose was to and Rabbi Weinberg, Yosel Weinberg, tells a story that he, someone from Oklahoma needed to get an urgent answer from the Rebbe. So he put a note. The Rebbe was seeing people in Yechidus to the wee hours of the morning. He put a note in the crack of the door, anticipating the Rebbe's secretary would see it. And he didn't see it. So the note fell to the door, and the Rebbe himself bent down and picked it up. And Rabbi Weinberg felt very bad that he made the Rebbe bend down and pick up his note. He felt that he was disrespectful. So he wrote a letter to the Rebbe apologizing about that incident. And the Rebbe didn't understand why he was apologizing. The Rebbe responded, Is this not my whole purpose? To bend down and pick up what other people don't notice. 
and helping someone in prison very much hmm. is in line with that. Hmm. With their when, family. This is a bit reversed, but w- when you say the Rebbe, just if you could clarify a little bit of the dynasty and who the Rebbe was. Yeah, the Lubavitch Rebbe, Rebbe Nachem Schneerson, who is the uh, Chabad Lubavitch world leader, uh, recognized as uh, you know, a, a leader for all of mankind, unconditional love, who uh, lifted up a community after the Holocaust and revived Jewish life in a way that was almost unprecedented, caring both for the individual and the macro on a very special level. And uh, the Rebbe's teaching can be found on Chabad.org, C-H-A-B-A-D.org, with uh, tremendous insights. And there's a book by Joseph Telushkin called The Rebbe, which anyone interested should read. It's a, it's a game changer. Mm. It's really beautiful. Joel, did I, I know that once this breaks, you're going to have like three amazing questions that I'm going to, that I'm not going to, I'm going to kick myself for three months. You know, this is, this is the man that works in the prison system and I know you have something, but um, I know, I know the rabbi has a heart out. All right, but yeah, one question, just explain the dichotomy between cultural differences between white, not only black, Hispanic, and what are the major cultural differences that you see where people face this? And what are those pushbacks that you guys try to fight the cultural differences? Even with even religious aspects as well, with Muslim, Jewish communities, Christian communities, what are the major cultural differences that you see in the prison system? Are there some advantages or disadvantages? Yeah, so, I mean, you know, as... In the prison system, there are many different communities and people of different walks of life. As an organization, we work very closely with uh, all the communities as a common cause. Uh, of course, certain communities are impacted more than others. Uh, the African-American community is impacted in a very big way uh, in the prison system. And some of our greatest partners in this work are from the African-American community. Um, you know, Van Jones and his group have been a tremendous uh, partner and I think there's a it really is a to a certain degree a unifying force where we all work together to achieve a, a common goal and Olive's work is non-denominational and we've been fortunate to work with people and help people from all walks of life and it's been an eye-opening I'll be honest with you it's been a, we've received some beautiful communications where uh, there's a Puerto Rican guy who said he was brought up that a Jew would never help a Puerto Rican or or you know and we've taken you know cases of of people from different communities we just worked on a case of a really deserving african-american gentleman and took it to a very high government official and thank god we were able to achieve a, a very positive response one of the our key clemency cases right now is an african-american mother serving a 30-year sentence and we just are working at it on a very high level and god willing anticipating good news but there's a we're all there for each other and to help one another with god's help amen that's really beautiful yeah, I, I I worked many months, whatever whatever pro bono work I was doing, for many months without helping a Jewish person. I was like, does this organization help Jewish people? I don't even know. <laughs> but um, but to push back, uh, not to push back, push a little bit more. Well, what what do you see? You mentioned that the African American community. You, see, you said that there is a bigger negative impact. Like, what well, what does that what does that look like? Pre sentencing, post sentencing. There's what, you know what are you referring to exactly? Yeah, I mean, there's a you know there's a a large African American population in prison, significant. I forget the numbers, but it's a, a very high population, and many of them don't belong there and really deserve a, a second chance. And uh, you know, it's something that we were proud to work on, and sad, but we're very proud to to work on together with our friends, colleagues, allies, to make a difference for all of mankind. Just systematically, is there a way to change that structure? That, as you've seen, working behind the cases. Edu- education, um, understanding people, not prejudging people by any factors is a very, very important factor. I think our country is going to be moving in the right direction in this regard. There's a lot of reasons for hope, and you know things are changing. But uh, seeing the human being for who they are, not uh, unfortunately, many communities sometimes are just, just preconceived notions, you know, mis- misconceptions and. Uh, it's our job to see every person as a human being with a soul and potential and treat them with love and compassion. Hmm. Last question, because uh, you have to go. I, as you see, as Florida is trying to get rid of the cultural education, is that important in the United States, cultural education? 
to push the difference, I guess the differences in narratives of uh, cultural differences and, and accepting those aspects or just having an American cultural, like a, uh, like a symbiote where it's just like, we're the American people, no matter the difference, we don't care where you came from or the history of different cultural aspects. Is that important to the, the education of background? In, I mean, I, I'm not educated enough to speak on particular the practices of Florida, but in general, my personal belief is absolutely every person is uh, has a you know rich historical background, and that should be celebrated. The nuances yeah, you talked about, like the mitigation videos, sure. to show a day in the life of someone, so yeah. that a judge can have some insight as to like the different people that they touch and the network of of human beings. It's so fun to be in the room with you when you're doing these kinds of things and working with you and even talking with you now. Because you're more polished than so many of the attorneys that I work with, and you don't have a legal background or legal education, to my knowledge. And I think that that's very interesting. I'm polished. That's, a, that's <laughs> the first one for me. <laughs> but thank you. And I think that um, I take compliments, no matter how insincere. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, don't, I didn't. I didn't say that you. You know, you're. you're, you're yeah. Well, anyhow. But um, um, no. I, what I was just. What I was just now getting at is that there. There's a certain. The word is heimishness, which is like a warmth and and. Uh, uh, that you're able to cultivate, but th th you definitely have this ability to be professional. You mentioned That's Yossi. Up, yeah. You mentioned Yossi Brisky. Also, like he's advocating in court, and he's not an attorney. It's so interesting that that you your your organization has found that intersection where you're able to be effective without having the preconceived notion of having these credentials that would qualify you to do that. To a certain degree, it's even more impactful. Like I think courts recognize, you know, the sincerity of someone like Rory Brisky who comes in and coming from a very pure altruistic place, just committed to helping the person. I think many courts have recognized the, you know, the depth of that and we've been fortunate to see the impact with God's help. Thank you so much. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you. Thank you so much, Joe. Hey. All right, it's 100 days from today, right?